lecture. Today we are, uh, I'm super, super excited to have, to, uh, to introduce uh, Philip Rosdale. So, um, Philip is a um, serial inventor, uh, visionary that thought about uh, founding uh, companies that are related to VR or related ideas um, uh, 30 years ago, which is, uh, sounds, sounds insane and very inspiring. Uh, so, um, so if you have heard of Second Life, so uh, that was that was uh, uh, super super famous. Uh, when I was, I remember that I was in uh, uh, in grad studies. I thought that that is really inspiring. Look at like uh, trying to uh, trying to uh, connect with people all over the world through a social environment, which is a, a game-like environment. But there are also social connections there, and businesses and so on. I thought it's uh, uh, a crazy idea, uh, and uh, um, so currently Philip is a uh, co-founder of High Fidelity and the CEO, and they invented many things that he's going to tell us about. And so, uh, welcome! Thank you for uh, cool. coming. Thanks. So I was told that we can have a uh, interactive thing here, and so I would encourage you guys. Um, I have a you know a history of my work, and we'll talk about that. Um, but given that you guys are, in many cases, the experts and more expertise on some of this stuff than I am, I would encourage you to ask me questions. And then I don't think I'll really even go that long. And then we can have questions at the end. I, you know, as an inventor and as a designer, I, I enjoy the opportunity to come do talks like this because um, whenever I try to write it all down, you know, I catch myself. It's like. Learning, learning a subject better by teaching it. You know, it's like trying to explain this stuff is always helpful to me. So I value your thoughts on this as well. So just interrupt me with questions because I like that. I, I enjoy doing it that way. Um, what I thought I would do is give you a little bit of right the inspiration and kind of background, my, my own background. You know, uh, how I how I came at this and what my inspirations were, and then some of the early things that I did even before Second Life, and then Second Life itself, and what did we learn from that? And then High Fidelity, which is what I've been working on for the last six years. How many people don't know anything about Second Life? There's some of you, right? Who don't know? A couple of you? Okay, cool. Because um, it's been a while now. Second Life, I started it in 1999. That's unbelievable. I, I, can't, I can't even believe I'm that old. Um, and then high fidelity, and then, and then I'll talk a little bit about just kind of general thoughts on VR and AR and the future uh, to, to the best that I can convey some knowledge to you. But starting with that kind of like inspiration, I think a lot of people in VR, for example, came from the gaming background. So they played games and they fell in love with those games and then, of course, wanted to bring those games, you know, to the new silver screen of VR. In my uh, case, it was a little bit different. Um, I grew up loving uh, electronics building things. I was, very, I was a very inventive kid. Uh, it was, I, I was the time before computers, so I did not have uh, desktop computers until I was in, in you know, middle school and beyond. Uh, and then, of course, the internet was the big you know, bomber for me that, that happened right when I was just getting out of college. So you know, I'm, I'm sort of like, from a, in terms of it's all about you know, timing and where you were at a certain time, I'm kind of one generation, I guess, or you know, 10 years younger than Gates and Jobs, meaning that I didn't get the PC dropped in my lap, I got the internet dropped in my lap. So that, for me, was the big thing. But even before that, I was really into uh, electronics and building things and then programming. And one of the things that I was most moved by was this idea of complexity and complexity in computers. And this is a Scientific American from 1994, Stephen Wolfram, who's the mad, brilliant scientist, physicist, mathematician, and one of my advisors, who I get to talk to once in a while about this stuff, super cool, uh, had written this in 1984. And Th these, these wonderful patterns, the Wolfram Automata, you know, you could reproduce them pretty easily by reading this article. As a young programmer, uh, I was in, uh, I think this was right at the beginning of high school, end of middle school. I had an Apple IIe, and I programmed, I wanted to see that little triangle show up, so I programmed it so that it would run this one-dimensional automata and make those little pixels on the screen. But it went so slowly at that time, this is like 1984, that it was, it was unbearable, like written in basic, to make that automata. And so that got me into assembly language because I was, I was at my 
uh, aunt and uncle's house, and I, I had to figure out how to make this thing go faster. And so I found there was like three keys on the Apple that you would hit, and it would break you into the assembler, and then you could write assembly language. And so I remember, you know, the marvel of writing assembly language on a computer because it suddenly rolled, scrolled off the screen so fast and looked really pretty. But uh, along with that, I was really, really interested in uh, complexity and in the idea that you could use computers to simulate or create systems that had an enormous amount of complexity to them. So I'm one of those people. That's what turned me on was this idea of like big, unfathomably complicated universes of stuff somehow inside the computer. That's what really motivated me. And in fact, another story I can remember was when Windows came out. This is, in the, this is now about like 1980 six or something like that. My buddy had a Windows computer, but what I can remember us doing was we got one of those early Mandelbro, is that how you pronounce his name? Mandelbrot. Mandelbrot, thank you. We got one of those scrollers. You know, you remember how you'd use these where you'd zoom in, but you'd zoom in right there, and then it would blow. Now, now back then in the 80s, it took, a, it took it a good bit of time to do that. And so I remember my friend and I kind of went on the journey or whatever you want to call it of like zooming in more and more into this picture until we ran out of machine precision. At some point, basically, most of these programs wouldn't like refresh the bits or whatever, so you'd run out of data and it would all just turn blue or something at the end. And I remember really being affected by the experience. We'd zoomed in and zoomed in and zoomed in until we ran out of computer, so to speak, and then we said, okay, wait a second, knowing math the way we do, how many times did we zoom in? Like 12 or 15 times or something. Well, how big is the original image, this image? And it was the size of Earth. And I remember being like, that's just, that's just ridiculous that you could compute, you know. You could use a computer to sort of simulate some great, you know, coastline or whatever that was of that scale. And so, again, that really, really moved me as a kid. And then, of course, I, I got into uh, the game of life, you know, Conway's Automata, which just totally... Uh, blew my mind, you know, that the idea of, of, of a, a, a two-dimensional lattice in which you had this state machine and it really started to look like animals or creatures or something and this is just a great video here, I'll just kind of skip ahead in it, but it's just so fun, they just keep showing you at all the size scales, all the little gadgets you can make with these automata and I'll just skip ahead a little bit, but you guys have probably all seen this, I love the big Game of Thrones music in the background. <laughs> But you know, this is somebody you've seen, if you've probably seen these, you can build self-replicating machines, you can build working computers out of the game of life, stuff like that. And so, you know, as a kid, I just, I couldn't get enough of this stuff. And then later, I finally saw this. How many people have seen this, the murmuration of the stylings? Come on. If you've seen this and you're not moved by it, there's something wrong with you. You know, these birds are executing three rules, which are now well understood. Mr. Craig Reynolds was the guy, Boyd's, 1980-something, that actually did this on the computer. But, you know, you can program these birds on a computer and they look just like this. Now, how mind-boggling is that? You know, that they perform these, these kinds of acrobatics and create these sort of amazing patterns. Uh, entirely under the animation of three simple rules. So that idea that complexity could emerge from, you know, the machine and that, that, that we could uh, create it in the computer, that was what really motivated me. So hopefully I've drilled that into your heads. And then at the same time, we've, we kind of had this gradual transition toward both the internet and then to VR. And of course, this is from the very first generation of VR. In Berkeley in 19... About 1986, I think. UC Berkeley put one of these ridiculous gadgets in their game center, and I took what money I had at the time, and a friend of mine, and the two of us bought plane tickets, I was in San Diego at the time, flew to Berkeley, sat in the game center, spent, it was like $10 a game to play this thing in, in, in 1980-whatever dollars, and we sat and we played it. I played it like three or four times, which is all the extra money I had after I paid for the plane ticket. And then I sat there all day and I just interviewed people and asked them, like, did it make you sick? What do you think was cool about that? Why did you like it? That's how into VR I was uh, even, even then in the late 80s. I was, I was uh, or you know, 1990 or something. I was really, really into this idea of simulating worlds and then going inside them. And in fact, shifting over to some sort of early ridiculous experiments. I've never found a, I didn't take pictures of a lot of ridiculous things I did when I was a kid, but this was one in my garage, 1992, and a college. 
I built this, which is, you know the omnidirectional treadmill? This was even more crazy. It's basically a big lazy Susan in these long metal bars that I'd gotten out of the physics lab at UC San Diego. And it had these foot pads on it that slid and there was a, a chain that went around here. And basically made it look like, it was like a big Nordic track machine where you'd slide your foot back and the other one would go forward. And so the, by doing that, if you automated that with a motor and by turning the lazy Susan underneath you, if you think about it, you could kind of like move your feet any way you wanted to and it would keep you centered in the middle of the thing. And that was because I was, I was like, thought, I thought that, I, I think I did this motion platform thing because, and I'll, get to, I'll, I'll show you a picture of this later. I was, uh, I considered it to be impossible at that time to build a head-mounted display. Having seen this virtuality thing and some other stuff, it was, these things were so expensive at the time, it seemed inconceivable to me that any sane person would ever have a head-mounted display. And so I concluded instead that I had to do something like, make you somehow like have your face in front of normal screens somehow, but like the rest of your body moving underneath you or something. Like you would have to somehow not have a head mounted display. And I think that motivated some of these contraptions that I built. But then about 1994, as I said, I moved to the Bay Area. Some of you may, how many of you being from Seattle have any, yeah, you have some recognition of this. Um, so, I came, after college, having built a couple of these ridiculous contraptions in my garage, I came to San Francisco. And when I came to San Francisco, I discovered the World Wide Web, which was happening. I was so fortunate to move there, I was like at ground zero, because basically the Caltrain station in San Francisco, 1994, was where it all began. Some of those early like game companies even, like the earliest versions of Fortnite, if you will, were happening in, in, in the mid-90s right there in San Francisco. And so of course I got there, people told me about the internet, I already knew a bit of networking, it was perfect timing, I was like, how could I possibly fail? As a young entrepreneur, you know, I was, I was like, this was just handed to me. I mean, just the internet was just handed to me, um, you know, as a, as a creator. So it was great. I didn't think at the time in 1994 that it would be possible to build the matrix. Um, I didn't think that it could be done because, as you probably may or may not remember, 3D graphics didn't work at that time. There wasn't a way to use a computer to do 3D, really. I mean, it was, it was all really hacked together. Um, and certainly the computers people had on their desktops couldn't do it. So I, I, I tried to think, well, what can I do instead while I wait? If you go back and ask my friends, they'll tell you I was nuts about this idea of like a virtual world and a virtual world on the internet. But I figured that I couldn't do it in the 90s, in the mid-90s. So what am I going to do in the meantime? Well, I had this, I had my own little company that I had started when I was a teenager. And I got up to San Francisco and I just said, the internet, I'll just start hacking. And I ended up building this thing up here. That's my friend Gary, who was my physics TA. He had gone on and gotten his physics PhD at Slack. I had stopped with my bachelor's degree. That's me with a little mustache or something on the right. And that thing was called Freeview. And that was a, you can kind of see how pixelated Gary's face is, that was a 28.8 modem video conferencing experience that actually worked and you could call multiple people around the world. And one of the things that really moved me to do what I've done had been the experience of making a few calls to people with that. You all take for granted, we all take for granted today that we're connected to everybody around the world like perfectly. I mean, you know, we've got friends with which, we have friends on other continents, all of us do, and we can play games with people, you know, and we don't even know where they're from. Well, it wasn't like that in the mid 90s, you know. The idea of being able to talk to somebody in Japan or Russia over the internet, you know, or, or, or you know, Finland where they had crazy bandwidth back then, even back then. Uh, was just nuts. And, and, and so I was really moved by that idea of just making contact with people, making kind of eye contact with people across the world. And I think as an entrepreneur, uh, that really uh, changed me. You know, that was, along with the simple availability of the internet, the, the idea that I could connect with people at a great distance from each other really affected me. And of course, you can imagine I come back to that later. But so I, I built this thing and we ended up selling this little company in, in 1995 to real networks that didn't have real video yet. They only had real audio and real audio they started in 1995 here in 1996. I joined in the beginning in 1996, February, and I was there through the companies going from about 50 or 60 people to about 700 people and we went public during that time so I got to go along for the ride on all the insanity that was version one of the consumer internet. Um, in 19, what's next year? 
in 1999, uh, and this is a completely new presentation, by the way. I hope you, I hope you like it. I never do a same presentation twice. Um, but in 1999, two things happened that were fun. And, and we were really there to see them at Real Networks because we were serving audio and video to people and the company was getting bigger. I was the CTO when I, at the time that I left. So we were watching all these trends. I got to be Mr. CTO and watch all these technology trends. And there are two things that happened in 1999. This was one of them. I bet a lot of people in here know what that is. This was the big moment. NVIDIA released the GeForce 2 chip and it, was, it went into the Dell and Gateway and ThinkPad, no, no, not ThinkPad. It went into the desktop computers of that time. So, so suddenly we had a chip that could do two million triangles per second with OpenGL, and that was pretty fast. Um, and not far off what we have today. I mean, it, it, it got pretty close. It, you know, it brought us into the modern era of 3D. And then the second thing that happened, which you can see right there, the second thing that happened was broadband took off. And it, it, if you were watching all the, the numbers like we were at Real Networks, you knew that it was game over for broadband. That's broadband across like the whole country. Yeah, across the whole country. But in fact, you know, here in Seattle, it was like, w it was way more obvious that broadband was totally going to win and take over the internet. Broadband, by the way, I thought was 200 kilobits per second. I was like, who would ever need more than that? That's unbelievable. I should be able to build a virtual world um, if I just have 200 kilobits per second. But so in mid-99, I left Real Networks, uh, dropped everything, went back to San Francisco, opened... Uh, 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 got, got an old warehouse in an alley in Hayes Valley called Linden. Went back there, set up myself, got another buddy from physics, Andrew, to join me, not the one who was in that picture, but a different guy, we all knew each other, and he joined me this time to help start uh, Second Life. And this was really fun. Um, I was telling this story earlier. Believe it or not, I think, <laughs> there are many crazy interface ideas and inventions and gadgetry and application ideas in, in VR and AR that we are yet to see. And let me just give you a crazy proof of that because I bet I'm going to give you an idea here that you haven't even thought of and it's just nuts. It's just one of these crazy like hardware interface ideas. This is from our patent filing which has been so long ago it's expired now. You're, you're free to use the idea I'm about to give you <laughs> for whatever good or bad it may serve you. Um, so. Remember that I mentioned that motion platform, and I really wanted to figure out how to move on the platform. Um, uh, when, I, when I built uh, that platform, it was this idea that I couldn't build a head-mounted display. And I was convinced uh, back then that I couldn't build a head-mounted display, but I thought of this idea, which was, rather than have that light, impossibly light, expensive thing on your face that you couldn't afford, what if I somehow could make you feel like you were moving around and you know, wandering around in room scale VR, but you weren't actually, you weren't moving at all. What if I basically strapped you into a big apparatus of some kind that immobilized you? Your head, your arms, and your legs, you couldn't move at all. And the idea we had, which worked, which I'm gonna tell you about, there's a very inexpensive device called a strain gauge. People, somebody in here has probably worked with these, but this is a little piece of, this is a little resistor that you super glue onto a piece of metal, and it'll tell you with great sensitivity if there's any pressure being put on the metal. So if you have like a big metal bar that's like thick metal, you can put one of these suckers on it, and just for a couple of dollars of electronics, you can detect the weight of just the tiniest weight of your fingertip on the other end of that bar. So we, we built this contraption, it didn't look exactly like that. I wish I had pictures of it, it was so crazy. It scared the hell out of our early investors. I think it made them like us. I mean, just because anybody would make something that nuts. Big thing, size of a car, we would put you into it. We built a tri-fold screen with a back projector just like that that would give you a full field of view. So you were pretty immersed, it was pretty cool. But as I said before, imagine that you couldn't move your head because you were sitting with your chin and leaning it against a kind of a cup, you know, like one of those things they use in ophthalmology or whatever. So you couldn't move your head at all. But when you tried your turn your head to the left or right or up or down, we would detect that strain that you were putting on the metal and then turn your view. I don't know if you ever had that experience of like having a car go backwards at the intersection and you stomp on the brakes. It was like that. Like so freaky. Still to this day, I want to rebuild this thing. If anybody wants to help me, let me know. But to this day, such a powerful experience. Like it was really weird. Like we could bring our hands up and we learned to walk. We actually did build the foot thing so I could like 
walk around as an avatar, but I wasn't walking. I was just trying to walk with my muscles. Very, very interesting idea. But just gives you an idea, that was actually, that, strangely enough, that was actually the very beginning of Second Life. Um, pretty soon we realized that we weren't going to uh, do this whole thing by, uh, by building hardware. You know, we realized that it was so early, by the way, I think there's a lesson to be taken and wasn't taken by yours truly right here today, but, you know, building hardware, <laughs> having to get millions of people to get new hardware, if that's a barrier to your being successful, that is unfortunate for you. Um, say, say right now. But I'll get to that. But um, so, so what we did instead then was we said, let's build the metaverse. Let's build, our, uh, let's build what we believe is going to be needed for people to go into a virtual world together and just do anything they want. Hang out, play games, go to school, do anything. You know, again, I was very enamored of this idea of building a big world. And this picture kind of captures all of what I still, still there's a lot of stuff in Second Life that hasn't been replicated, not even by my company, and not even by all the other VR companies. Let me just point this out. There's two other people in the background there, and they're standing there. I did this two days ago in Second Life, just to make this picture for you. That's me and my famous assless chaps, which was a, a, <laughs> another story about my avatar. But um, what I've just done is I've built a primitive, right? So you see my avatar going like this. I'm making this primitive. The primitives, the atoms, the digital atoms in Second Life were pretty cool. You could twist them. You could cut them. They had kind of, I would say, just the right degree of malleability that you could make things like very small pieces of like glasses frames or earrings or dresses or anything you wanted with them. They were, they were pretty good, especially for the time. Not good enough today, I don't think. But you could edit them, and the other people standing there were just watching you do it. So they could sit and chat with you and say, what weird thing are you going to make right now? You know? And, and, and there are sandboxes. This is actually what's called a sandbox. A sandbox in Second Life means a place that is generally open for all to build anything they want. And typically, like every four hours, everything deletes itself in there. So that's me making a test object. And then the coolest thing about Second Life was that you could attach code to every one of these objects and just edit it right then, and it ran. So just like HTML and JavaScript, Second Life gave you objects and what we called LSL. Um, so that's kind of that. By the way, that, that idea of, well, I'm going to get to that, but that idea of like live editing and collaboration is key to what's going to happen. And in addition to that, we did this on a two-dimensional map where each server was one of these squares. That's a server, that's a server, that's a server. And as, the, as people wanted them, we put more and more of these servers online and actually auctioned them off to people in these public auctions. And that became Second Life. And today, so as a result of the combination of letting people build and then letting them build next to each other and being able to walk miles, you know, this is a waterway, right? I mean, this, this is an aerial view, this is a satellite view. You know, this is people would put a free sex, for rent, future world, Russian uh, sign. People would put all kinds of advertisements on the roofs of their houses because they knew that the satellite imaging was what made the, the Google map of the whole thing. Dig that. That's kind of a cool emergent behavior I wouldn't have thought of. So all of that, real, uh, so all of that worked, and then that really succeeded. We kept scaling it up. And we ended up with what we've got today, which is an area in Second Life about the size of Los Angeles, about 20,000 servers, and uh, huge. Uh, uh, 50,000 people at a time in there, still, still by far the largest virtual environment of this kind of general purpose sort, um, even compared to some of the successes in the early successes in VR. Um, that is actually a massing diagram view, which was drawn of all the servers. Of course, we couldn't render that in real time, so we did that offline one time just with boxes. And I just always I thought it was kind of charming looking to, to see it like that. But you basically had this enormous sprawling metropolis. The economy was one of the key things that enabled it. I'll get back to that. But, but uh, the economy today in Second Life, today Second Life is still the same size that it was at its largest, but it never grew larger. So for the last about 10 years, it's been about the same size, which is about a million people a month use it. 50,000 people at a time online. And most interestingly, amongst that kind of city-sized space, a virtual economy going on, which has a scale of about six to seven hundred million dollars US a year in transactions between people, mostly for clothing, furniture, housing materials, teaching desks, things like that. So stuff to kind of fill the virtual world. Very interesting in terms of giving us uh, a look at what's uh, yet to come. I didn't start watching my time. How far, how much time have I used so far? Half an hour. Half an hour? Yeah, but then I want to give time for Q&A. Okay. 
So what did we learn from Second Life? As I said, this idea of collaborative building is core to these experiences. Just like the way refreshing a page on the web was, so, so too we have to get to something in VR, in my opinion, that looks like that. And we don't have it yet. We don't know what it is. Economies of scale can work. People are basically good. You know, we're in the midst of this huge societal conversation about technology being evil. But I think that Second Life was ample evidence that it could be good. Uh, you know, people in Second Life are and always have been pretty good to each other. I think the reason for that is that it's a highly transparent environment. It doesn't have boundaries. It doesn't have rooms. It's all one big space. You, it's very easy to invade other people's space, sometimes to a fault. But I think that's caused us to behave better. So that's just something to think about. Um, yes? What do you think motivated people to participate and be a part of Second Life as opposed to some other more traditional goal-oriented environment? Yeah, so what, what motivated people to do Second Life versus a goal-oriented environment? I think the fact that they could, they could exhibit so much creative self-expression. I mean, I think the idea of a goal-oriented experience is adequate as a context. I think Fortnite is a good context. But around that, you've got to have an ability to be expressive that's adequate. And I don't think anything was yet adequate. You know, like the idea of playing World of Warcraft was good as a context, but it wasn't expressive. So I think it was just that people had that. In 2012 was about the time that I started High Fidelity. So fast forward uh, six or seven years from when Second Life was at its biggest. And two more things happened, which I'll just touch on briefly. This chip came out. I bought one. This is, this is a SparkFun chip that's basically one of the chips that was in the Rift. So at about the same time that the Rift Kickstarter was up, I got one of those chips and was putting it on a scope at the office. And I basically said to the seven or eight people that were there with me, we're going to start a new company. We're going back into VR. Because I saw how fast those chips were, and I knew that something like the HMD would be possible. The LCDs seemed doable, but that chip, that gy that's actually the gyro, not the integrated accelerometer and gyro. The gyro chip was the coolest thing. It still is. The other thing that was happening was that um, hap thanks to Netflix, this is 2012 right here, thanks to Netflix, really, routers had to get updated. So latency got really low. And latency is a, is a really important thing. You think about Oculus and all this stuff, but the really interesting thing is that what VR is deeply about, I think, is communication and connection, connecting people and allowing them to do work together, go to school together. And to do that, you need to have low latency. You need to have a latency of about a tenth of a second between people. That's what allows us to do what we're doing right now. Everybody knows what a phone call is like when it's above that latency. 300, 400 milliseconds, which is what your phone calls typically are, it doesn't feel good. You, you can't connect with people. You can't know that you're being heard, for example. So what happened at about 2012 was that the, the halfway time to anywhere on Earth, again, thanks to Netflix, dropped to about 1.5, 1.7 times the speed of light, which gets you, I'm hand-waving a little bit, but most of the time, it means you can get anywhere you want in 100 milliseconds. So if you could do everything else in the software correctly, you could, you could, you could, you could get to this. This is an ITU study that I love that shows the knee of the curve here, right at about 100 and 150, 180 milliseconds. This was done with cell phones. Just to, so funny that they did this study as scientists and then published this, the ITU. And then nobody cared, and they made the cell phones twice. They put the cell phones over here. People are stupid. So. Armed with the idea that we could improve human communication, one of the first things we did, and I'll show you the video of this, was we put one, this, we built this at our office. We took some fake, sun, fake glasses and we put the gyros and everything on the little chip card there on the back, plugged it into a USB B port, and wanted to be able to animate just the head of an avatar along with audio, along with doing audio, and see what that felt like. And this is what it felt like here. This is super cool. The campfire. The campfires provide enough plain old regular visible light to show this sorry affair for what it is. A bunch of demented boy scouts, a jamboree without merit badges or hygiene. With the IR super... Boy scout hand? <laughs> what book is he reading from? First page of Silver. That's oh. right. So that's Grayson, one of our guys at work long ago, reading from Snow Crash. But you can see that the, the, the ability to capture just the head motion with the gyro really conveys a lot. So again, where other people were thinking about rendering the scene, I was thinking about communicating. So we were kind of thinking more about this idea of audio and video and communication than anything else. Um, oops. So. That was our very first experiment. But about five years ago, we kind of started soldiering on into what we've done so far with high fidelity. 
And to that extent, I would just like to defend, this is my parts list for the metaverse. In other words, beyond gaming, beyond the VR hardware, what do we need to do? We need to do 3D audio. This room doesn't work unless we can hear each other spatialized correctly. Trust me, it has to work that way. Big crowds. How many people are here at this? So to, to, to move this into VR, we've got to be able to support 120 people or whatever. And that problem is a substantial one. So the yellow things are the things we, I say we need to do, but that we still haven't really started. And the blue things are at least somewhat done by high fidelity. Um, reputation, we talked about this a lot. This is a big issue right now. Privacy. As we begin to go into VR to, to do work, to do entertainment, to do school, what degree of information about our identity are we going to need to give away? I'm going to argue not, not, not a lot. Like the real world, we're not going to just have our names over our heads to point back to our Facebook accounts. That's silly. What that means, I think, is that you're going to eventually need a very rich system of reputation, of regard, so that you can know, does somebody have a good credit score? Or do they work at, they, are they a student of this school? Are they a friend of a friend of yours? There's going to be a lot of rich systems that we need for that. Payments. Obviously, big thing with Second Life. We need to have some fundamental way to exchange value in the virtual world. And since as avatars, people are usually from different countries, uh, you're usually not going to share a payment system. So kind of fundamentally, and this, of course, motivated a lot of our development work around blockchain cryptocurrency. But one way or another, you need a, you need a payment system. Connected servers. This is something that I'm most passionate about that we haven't started working on yet, but we've talked about it and we've said like what we think the idea is. But the internet is compelling because of all the hyperlinks between the pages. In the case of the internet, the hyperlink you know, is, is what we all know it to be. It's a reference typically between a word and another page. What is the equivalent of that when we're all deploying spaces, right? I think it's some kind of an embedded, nested, recursively nested space. That is, I can put your University of Washington campus on my street if I want to, and when you're on my street and my server, if you look over there, you'll just see it. Something like that needs to be done. There's a hyperlink in the metaverse, and we need to design it, figure out what it is. Live editing and programmable matter, that's scriptable objects I touched on before. There needs to be some general architecture whereby if I drive my car from one place to another in the metaverse, it and its code, whatever its interactive components are, comes with it. And if I drive across a boundary from one server to another server, it has got to work. I mean, there has to be some degree of standardization there. And then level of detail. You know, we've all seen Grand Theft Auto, but what we need to get to is a Grand Theft Auto where the uh, city is actually updated as you change things on the ground. And as we all know, Grand Theft Auto is kind of a one-way compression. Today, we need both ways, where if I, you know, if I move this coffee mug, that tiny pixel a mile away is visible to somebody else. Maybe not for a few minutes or something, given machine time, but it has to happen that way. And in our early years, we did some cool work. I'll just show you some pictures that was pretty cool of this. That, this is a, <laughs> kind of dim, but this is a voxelized landscape in a building where we're basically representing everything using infinite level of detail. So you're looking out above about 15 kilometers there, and the faraway boxes are uh, summary voxels of many, many smaller boxes inside them. So we did a sort of continuous level of detail. Um, we even did fun stuff like this. You can see me sort of doodling around like this with my co-founder next to me as a first sort of avatar. We ultimately realized that we just weren't smart enough yet to figure out how to make a voxelized system capture all the detail we wanted for meshes and avatars. And so we kind of gave up on it a few years ago. But we were I remain very confident that we need a system that represents, in some Minecraft-like way, everything. Um, here's a picture of the biggest event we've been able to do so far. I'm going quick so I can stop and take questions. There's 400 people on the ground there. They're all yelling and screaming at each other. I'll show you a little video clip of that in a second. We did an avatar contest that day and gave away a few thousand dollars to people just to see, just to have a reason to get people to come together. But this is an example of something nobody's done before. I guarantee you, Oculus, Facebook, nobody's gotten anywhere close to this, um, to having hundreds of people in one space all waving their hands and arms around without any latency with audio. And I'll show you what that looked like as a video. I think this is going to jump to. This doesn't have like the big stereo sound. What you, what you can't get there, that was just insane. I was stage diving. <laughs> I was on the stage over here and I'd jump and like stage dive on people and then come back on the stage. But if you had the headphones on, that whole audience is yelling and screaming at you just like you guys could. And, and it's just completely crazy as an experience. A um, couple more slides. So where are we today? Um, 
So now it's seven. So we've been working on this for six years, and I think we're still uh, quite a ways from where we need to be. So here, let me shift to kind of where we are and what I think about the future. A couple slides on that. Um, whether you're talking about VR or AR, there are substantial undone, thi undone things in them. This is my summary of it. I think with VR and AR, to a certain extent, what we're really trying to do first and foremost is replace our screens, give ourselves a new computer screen on which we can work. And unfortunately, to work, you need to be able to read text and type, and you also need to be able to wear it all day. None of those three things are done yet, and even the Quest, as good as it is, does not deliver on any of those three. Slightly higher resolution. AR has got even bigger problems, and they, they bridge into privacy issues. You know, where are we in this room right now? That problem is not only a formidable technical problem, which I know a number of you here have worked on, but also even like a privacy and legislation problem. How, where are we going to store that data? What, what's safe? What do we have to do with it? And the other thing is that the AR displays, unlike like the Magic Leap, they need to be see-through. We're not going to use an on-face display unless we can see the other person's face. So we got to solve that problem, too. So that's a couple of problems. Beyond the hardware itself, where's the app? Where's the killer app for this, right? One observation going back to Second Life, I touched on it earlier, is that meeting new people is not enough anymore. We already did. We kind of won that war. Uh, we got everybody connected. So now we need to do more, you know, which is why I think we look at stuff like Fortnite and we say, that's fascinating. But when you look at Fortnite or even Pokemon, what game do we all want to play? A persistent myth of the metaverse is that we all began playing some game together, like the way Ready Player One, especially the movie, was painted. But I don't think that's true. I just don't know of a game that we all... Taking everybody in here as an ensemble, what's a game we all want to play? That we're so passionate about, we get all spun up and build avatars and make money and... Over what game? I don't think it's that. Education is ultimately, I think, probably one of the big booster rockets. If the people who teach here you know, at one of the most famous places for VR, could teach the rest of the world, the economic motive for that is tremendous. How much would people in, in you know, pick a faraway country in Australia, uh, how much would they want to and how much would they pay to be in this room as avatars right now? So that, I think, is really actually going to be one of the big ones. But the problem is, is that the hardware doesn't work for that. You're not going to go to class all day in a quest yet, not even in a quest. And so you got that problem, not in a hollow lens. What about working together? I won't touch on this more. We can talk about it more. But we at High Fidelity think there's something very interesting about uh, the shared workspace and the fact that people are starting to work remotely. And maybe we can use just audio and then sometimes the headsets to create a kind of a different workspace that has very interesting properties. But again, we're stymied by the fact that not in the headset. You can only use the headset for like presentations or something like this. Um, and so we're thinking a lot about that. So looking a little bit kind of to the bigger future of all this stuff, it is not about gaming. I don't know how many people here agree with this, but I think it's a bit of a miscue that we've gotten all spun up around building a new console market industry based on the VR headset. VR games are mostly, games are mostly single player. Single player is a terrible thing to do with a box on your head. Uh, and what's more, the markets that we think about as being the metaverse markets or the big economic impact markets, entertainment like live concerts, buying things online, going to school, and then travel. These are enormous markets, hundreds of times larger. And in fact, really, just look at that one, right? Do I need to say anything else? I don't need to say anything else, right? I mean, if the only thing we can do with VR was to not get on one of those. From a convenience, carbon, whatever. You pick your favorite thing about that, right? That's going to get pushed by VR. Another point about the future is this next screen thing. We were talking about this at lunch. I, that's, so I think you guys would agree with this, too. We, we are car carnivorous consumers of screens. Our screens are now too big. We are not going to carry a 65-inch screen around with us as some sort of a newspaper thing. The Westworld idea doesn't work. The folding thing, not even with those folding screens, it's not going to work. What we need is a screen on our face. I believe that the first thing we're really going to do with VR and AR is our email, our, our messaging. That's what we need to do with it first. I don't even think the 3D matters. Don't quote me. Um, the final big picture thought I always just, that's so near and dear to my heart again, getting back to my amazing emergent spaces. Here's just an interesting fact. If we took all of the about 1 billion machines that we have on the planet that are broadband connected and we made them all little tiles in some sort of a big tiling, you can do the math on that. But it turns out the math is it would look like GTA, be fully editable, and it would be the size of the above water surface area of Earth today at that level of detail. 
So dig that for a second, because that's a fact. Like, we have the technology today. Our technology or something like it would allow us to create a space that big. And then, of course, and you guys probably, some of you read about this, then you might ask the question, how fast are computers going to get? You know, can we ever catch up with the size of Earth? And of course, we can. And in fact, we're going to go not just a little bit, but, you know, our computers, before they reach essentially the physical limits of what we can do with matter in terms of computation, we're going to go something like a trillion, trillion times faster than we are today. Meaning that the virtual worlds of tomorrow that we're going to build aren't just comparable to the Earth. They're so much larger, and our opportunities within them so much larger, that they make the Earth uh, a tiny rounding error in all that. And so, you know, that is what personally, you know, bringing it back to the beginning, that is what motivates me, that, me to continue working on what I'm, what I'm working on, to continue working on VR. So let me stop there and take some questions. Let's do that. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, actually, this isn't a question. I've been uh, working on some of the interface problems that you've been talking about, and I kind of I want to talk about it. Um, we kind of saw that this the same problem, especially with typing, and made it so that you can use a mobile phone inside of a headset, um, connecting it. So you can somehow see the yeah. your headset. So you track it with fixed off, you map this, the, the, the canvas of the screen to a virtual canvas. Uh, we made it so when you pinch and zoom, the whole device gets bigger, so text is more readable. And then you can use the on-screen keyboards with your text. I would love to see that. I would love to see that. I was saying to Alex earlier in the lab, I, I got to see uh, some of the lab projects here. And I was saying that I think like something where you wear a quest and you look at a table and it somehow finds the table. You guys are the experts of that. But, and then it shows a keyboard that you can touch with your fingers on the table so that you can hit the table to hit the key. Seems like maybe possible? That's something that I think we haven't seen yet. But yeah, so that sounds, that sounds much more portable and practical though, right? You could do it like that. I, but I do think we need to get to keyboarding rates. Like, like I was saying, my, I can't believe it, but, but, but young people can type as fast on an iPhone as older people can type on a normal keyboard. That's weird. But we need to get that fast. We need to get to like normal typing speeds before we can use these headsets. Thanks, I, I'd love, love to see that. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's great. Um, um, I wonder what do you think about um, so Second Life had avatars, and I guess had you know, So what do you think about avatars versus realistic humans? Uh, I don't know. We were talking about that coming over. Um, We've done a lot of work. We've done scan. We've done like dupe scans to create avatars. So we have very high. We have very photorealistic avatars. Obviously, the Uncanny Valley and getting to real per performance photorealism in the moving face, particularly your own when you're looking in a mirror as an avatar, is very important. You know. So I. So I think there's still a, a valley to pass through there. Um, less realistic avatars. Facebook did a great presentation on this, which was really, really gorgeous. I think they really nailed it. Where if you know somebody really, really well, if it's the, if it's the person that you work with like every day, you can just have like a smiley face that you, you know that I've got like big bushy eyebrows, and so I just make bushy eyebrows, and everybody's like, it's him. Uh, but when you're meeting people in the, for the first time, say in a business meeting with somebody you haven't met before, whatever in VR, then you want to have a really photorealistic avatar, right? Because then it conveys your personality. So I think certainly in the end we veer toward realism, but there's still a bit of a valley to cross. And the good news, I think, is, is that the territory at the nearer edge of the valley, the place where we're more like cartoon looking, nobody cares anymore, particularly people that are younger. I mean, I know who, you know who agrees with me in here, but it's like, I'm delighted lately. We have this uh, app that we're working on, we haven't released it yet, that does a single shot photo of you and then turns that into an avatar. Everybody finds that like completely amusing, but I think if you showed it to people that are like 50 and older, they'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, and everybody younger is just like, fine, that's me, that's great, perfect. Let me, you know, adjust it a little bit and I'm good. So I think, I think like for work and many types of play and certainly school, there are simplified, more animation style representations that are perfectly adequate, but I think ultimately we certainly, especially if, any, if Second Life is any indication, we totally want photorealism ultimately because we want to be incredibly detailed, rich. We want to be ri richly described, beautiful, distinctive, with flowing hair that moves in the wind and everything for sure. And that's why we've kind of tried to do both as much as we've been able to. What are some of your current ideas of what a shared workspace, a collaborative workspace would look like? in VR, what some of the possibilities might be? I'm glad you asked me that. Um, so we have been doing this <clears throat> secret project at High Fidelity for the last two months where we sent everybody home. Uh, this is pretty cool, nobody knows this. Um, I talked about it, I've talked about it very little bit in public. 
Um, so in trying to figure out what the heck we're going to do while we wait for the Quest to get adopted or get improved, um, we started saying, like, what are we going to do with our technology platform? And so one of the ideas we had was, wait a second, what if we committed as an 80-person company to all of us working virtually on a tropical island, which is the workspace we've created? I, it, it, of course. And, and so we have this very beautiful island. I'd love to show you some pictures of it. I could show you a few afterwards. Um, uh, we have this very beautiful, like, tropical island with these little different, very carefully crafted. Our content team has worked a lot on it. Um, I, I believe that that type of workspace is, is very interesting. It's all about connecting people and allowing them to comfortably enjoy each other, not about like sharing screens and stuff. You have to have that, that's table stakes. But the experience of working together is one of establishing communion with your coworkers because that's the thing that if you're not co-located with each other, you can't do. And so our, our, my belief is, is that the powerful use for VR is in work, but not for the reason you think. It's because it addresses loneliness. And what's happening is we're all correctly, because we're enabled by Zoom and everything else, we're all beginning to go home. But the problem of going home is not that you're less productive. Google just did a study. You're more productive at home. It's that you're lonely. You're not getting social contact. And so the focus of virtual workspaces must be on maximizing and integrating that social contact in the right way. That's the believe the answer to that. So uh, I think you have nailed the uh, economy in the second life, but what's your uh, current uh, projection and uh, strategy in terms of nailing that in VR? We've tried, I mean, we're partway there. So what's the, what's the economic strategy for high fidelity for in VR? Um, so what we've been trying to do, what I, what I believe is going to happen is, or an outcome that I think would be great and is very achievable, is a blockchain-based stable coin of some kind a stable valued cryptocurrency that can be used by anybody in any country to exchange goods and services with each other uh, without a lot of transaction fees and with a high settlement time. If, if, for anybody who follows crypto, you know I'm sort of stating the four unachieved goals of crypto that for the last 10 years have remained strikingly unachieved. But nevertheless, they are possible. They're not, they're not, the laws of physics don't, provide, don't prevent us from doing that. We built a blockchain-based system which is currently deployed behind Second Life that is a single node right now blockchain, but it is at least prototypically correct in that regard. The blockchain stores currency itself has a, st has a stability management strategy. There are several different strategies for maintaining a stable coin, but you know, we can get into that later. And then uh, we recognize digital assets for digital goods on the blockchain, which is super cool. I didn't touch on that here, but that's the other thing that I think is really possible and important with, with blockchains, and we use it today. So what we do is we create a single hashed code which is stored on a blockchain so that your dress is truly yours irrevocably. You have the immutable private key to that single digital asset. Everybody else can inspect that key and know that you owned it or you, know, you, bought, it, you, know, you, you, you bought it from the designer for $1,000 at a show or whatever. Uh, that idea of immutable, uh, non-fungible tokens as the asset pointers on things in the virtual world, that's got to be the way it's going to go. What's your office going to have? Herman Miller chairs, right? The Herman Miller chairs in your virtual office, in your virtual workspace, will have digital asset tags on them that are, they could be stored in a central database, but probably a blockchain would be a pretty good way to, to do that. Yes? Um, kind of touching on the loneliness factor and, uh, on an added dimension to VR is that we have, we can see, I can see a lot of photorealism and 3D spatial audio bringing, uh, coming and making, bringing things to life. But there's also a really huge uh, part, of, part of that connection, which is touch. And I'm wondering if you have any ideas about uh, how to extend or use the tactile sense for the future moving forward. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, we have, we have a company represented here trying to, trying to have to uh, working on this. I think touch is hard. Um, I think there are types of touch which are going to happen that are going to be very cool, like maybe helping us type faster or uh, uh, helping us manipulate objects. Um, I think that touch as a sensory experience, you know, like giving somebody a hug, is really hard. Um, I guess I would say, I, like, I, as, a, as a technology optimist who bravely and sometimes to a point of failure attempts to solve every technological problem with coding and, you know, drilling holes and things, uh, I would say that touch is the one that even I, loving this stuff and having read all about it, I don't even have an answer there. Part of the reason I did that crazy rig strain gauge based thing was that I figured, hey, if you couldn't move at all, then I could at least stimulate your sense of touch better. You know what I mean? Like put, putting, putting touch 
uh, affordances all over a moving body, I, I, I don't know how to do that. I, I think there's really basic laws of physics there that are pretty hard. But some, but some progress is very possible and is happening already. Yeah. Um, I believe very much in that educational platform and a really big thing. Uh, so it would be very refreshing to hear from you that you, you know, didn't have that take as well. Uh, I think that we're going to come to a time of automation that's going to disrupt all the jobs that we have and people can go there and not only learn but teach others. And I was curious about your thoughts on jobs, anything you've been thinking about. You touched cryptocurrency already, which I wanted to hear, but uh, just jobs in general as a place that people can go to and, and exchange value. Yeah, and I was going to say, I think your idea, that's that statement of jobs are important. I think that's important even sort of outside the scope of like remote or distributed work. I think the general idea that people probably can find, we can find jobs that we can do for each other sort of in the metaverse. I believe that that is one of the fundamental ways that we as a human species will sort of enjoy each other in the future. That, that we, with the experience we will have together will be some sort of a creative economy in which we're doing something that is for the most part, insubstantial from a physical perspective. That is, we're not going to be building buildings or cars or, God forbid, airplanes. Um, we're going to instead be building experiences, you know, empires of the mind that we are in together somehow. So I, I, I think that's true. I think early stage cases of that would be something like, um, you know, people in roles where they don't have to actually be physically present being able to do jobs, you know. Um, uh, couldn't you be a... Uh, uh, a receptionist uh, uh, working somewhere or a knowledge worker of many other types as an avatar without needing to actually physically relocate yourself. I think this idea of increasing the radius of work that a human being has is one of the great stabilizers that our society could achieve. Think, for example, what it would mean for the American economy to give people a job where their location in the middle of what is a very large country was not a factor. I mean, that alone would be a huge win, you know, just for the United States. Um, get some in. I guess I was wondering, um, like, so in a metaverse, like, you kind of, like, say, in terms of Second Life, you guys have sort of a predefined set of rules and, like, morals that you've imposed upon everyone that's in there. So I guess as these develop, kind of how do you think that, do you think, like, maybe different metaverses will kind of be created with different varying sets of rules, or...? Let me play that back to what you said, which is great. Um, in Second Life, we had a kind of a single set of, I'm going to use the expression community standards, because I think that's most apt, that we had a single set of community standards, which we, by the nature of being a sort of a hosted service in which everyone could go everywhere, we sort of had to apply those common standards. I think that was a failure. Um, I think that what we learned from that was that there really is no, and should, there shouldn't be, any kind of global set of standards to which everyone is made to agree. I mean, for example, different countries on this earth have very different perspectives on things like intellectual property rights. Uh, it's complicated. So I think what's more likely to happen with the metaverse is that we're going to have federations of some sort of new kind of you know, nation states that are essentially different, different community standards. So I think that people will kind of um, find communities that are sufficiently fitting to their, their interests. You know, we were talking about this earlier, like, you know, your kids are going to go to school someday in VR, right? Someday, probably pretty soon. Well, you'll probably be pretty stringent about the environment that you want your kids to go to school in. I mean, you're probably going to have a pretty strict set of, of norms for what you want there. And I bet, I bet that there will be uh, virtual environments that within themselves, within an insular, uh, in, in an insular way, will provide you with whatever you want to, you know, be told about, about the teachers for your kids. But then at the same time, there will be, you know, you know, vast, you know, regions of cyberspace, if you will, that are, that are, that are have different community standards. So I think some sort of federation model in which there are many, many different, and again, I touched on connected servers before as one of the core missions that I think is most important for VR. Uh, is to figure out a way to connect, to connect the servers together that have different areas and with them different community standards. Yeah. Yes. Have you been thinking about uh, making this platform available for people with disabilities? Kind of a lot of websites aren't particularly good at that. Yeah. Obviously, I think there's an opportunity to um, provide support for people with disabilities in, 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 in virtual environments, which is ultimately superior to anything we've yet done. And so I personally feel like that's an important design consideration. I do think that, um, I, I, I would say on that front that 
everybody else in the industry has done a pretty good job of that. Uh, that is to say, I think there's a lot of people that are inspired and in thinking about uh, disability affordance. Um, so, by the way, I, I love high fidelity. In fact, I spent a lot of last year in it. Thank you, sir. Um, but my, uh, the framing of my question is this. Uh, right now, the current way that a lot of social VR platforms are is you download a package, you put it together, you upload your models. It's mostly sustained inside of your computer, and then it becomes very render intensive. Uh, what are your thoughts on going to something like Google Stadia, where it's all cloud-based, and then whatever you're getting is the final image? Yeah, so server side, should we use something like Stadia to do you know, rendering for virtual reality? With the advent of 5G, we will indeed, maybe, once 5G stuff gets out there, but we will, we will certainly get a transit time even to a mobile device sufficiently low that those latency concerns with respect to rendering will be met. I think the, econ personally, I think the economic problem, so with Second Life, we built a version of Second Life that rendered on the servers, so you streamed it because especially back then, people didn't have fast enough computers to run Second Life fast enough, and Second Life's really fancy with a lot of detailed graphics and tends to run slow. So we were very uh, intent on the idea that if we could build a server-based model, it'd be a good thing. The problem with it, at least at that time, and I only say this is kind of a what the roadblocks you have to get over, was that rendering on the server actually costs like a dollar an hour to the end user we had to pass along. And so we went to our end users and we were like, Here, here's the server rendered version of Second Life. It's only a buck an hour. People were spending 10 hours a day online. You do the math. Didn't make very much sense. They, nobody signed up because um, it was so expensive. Now, Stadia, you know, Google's new initiative, whatever, we, we may drive that price down. I'm, I'm, I'm like open-minded. I, I, I think that server-side rendering could be fantastic. It is, it is tricky because you're introducing another pretty high horsepower component into the, the whole stack or the link set there, you know, to get it working. But I do, I do like the idea. I mean, we could totally use that. I mean, we could modify high fidelity to do that. And obviously, parts of it, the audio, are essentially server-side rendered already. So. Uh, traditional university environments have uh, tr tremendously rewarded authorship and publication and looking at the very complex multi-dimensional relationship between engineers scientists, philosophers, inventors. Uh, from what I've read, it seems like there are, are some inventors who are missing the verbal hemisphere, which is maybe why they're so good at inventing, but uh, they're not gonna be attracted to a university environment if they don't like writing or they don't care to write. I mean, have you seen that? <laughs> That's great. You mean at the level of our own design philosophy, the idea of people- the university wants to encourage more inventiveness yeah. and uh, support it and attract inventors, but they put up the barrier or publish or, or perish, yeah. they're not gonna get inventors interested in a university environment. I think that's interesting. I don't know if we address that much, except that there are initiatives like more kinds of constructive visual programming and things like that. That's what that makes me think of. You know, There's a kind of a holy grail around wiring together small parts and having them turn into an automobile or something. I think we do need to get to that somehow. Um, a lot of people are working on it, but yeah, I mean, it's, I think that's a good point. I, I, yeah, I, I think it, it, yeah. I like to write, but I, I, I don't, probably don't do it as much as I should. I should write all more of this down. Yeah, so I was wondering what you think um, the step change will be for consumer VR uh, and, um, when, when will that be? Yeah, the nature, well, like I said, like I think that you have to, we have to be able to, the step change for consumer VR will be, I think, the safe bet is a device that can be comfortably worn for an extended period. I think the resolutions and quality that we have today are probably adequate for a lot of functionality. As I touched on earlier though, I think the ability to do messaging on these devices and to have them subsume a lot of our computing requirements, which largely today are provided on mobile, right? I mean, for the most part, as human beings today, we use mobile devices to do our computing, you know? So I would say that if once we get a consumer device that allows you to do anything you could do on your phone, you can do on that consumer device, then we're off to the races. Now, when is that? What do you think? <laughs> I mean, one more tick, you know? I mean, I think like if, 
I kind of have a feeling if you had the Quest and the Quest could see your fingers perfectly and you didn't have to hold the hand controllers, I think we might be pretty close to a shot on goal. Like I think if you had that device, so the Vive, the Vive Focus is supposed to be that. It's not yet, but you know, like I, th I think we're getting pretty close. So, so I guess what I would say is if you, if you push me to call the ball on that, I'd say, what do we have for a deploy cycle? We're looking at 18 months to get a new device, right? Say a, a big new good device. So I would say maybe 18 months from now we get a good device. And then we see uh, seven years to a billion, you know, is kind of what the compression curve looks like for new, you know, that's what happened with the smartphone. The smartphone took about seven years to get to everybody having the device. So maybe that, maybe like 18 months then plus seven years to where, to, to where it's over, you know, whatever that thing is, we're all, we all have them. I don't know. Yes. Fidelity coming to the Quest? It is. We have it running on the Quest. Um, but I don't know exactly when we'll release that. I think, I think we'll probably have to sideload it. Um, but I, I hear that's actually going to work pretty well. Yes? When you mentioned the possibility to like, work together in the metal materials or having education investors, and especially when like, uh, like, it's possible if a million people in the same class. So how, how, what's your vision for what kind of space that would be? Like, how is it um, different from current day space where you have a big class yeah. So what does the education space look like of the future in VR? Well, first of all, let me say, just like I, I let me just say I don't know. I mean, I, I think that the actual content experience of VR done right for education, I don't think we've, we've turned over enough cards on that yet. I think we're going to see ideas that are pretty new. I would say a couple of basic things though. I think people still need to look in each other's faces and like ask and answer questions or break up in study groups. So I think the human element of it, like the human element of like being together will be something the same. However, I'm sure we're all imagining the same thing, right? The environment around us should, can and should be changed. I mean, why would we, there's this idea of the memory palace, probably a lot of you are familiar with this, which is simply that we remember information, we store information in our brains using uh, structural references, which are basically like rooms in a building. We just tend to do that. There's all kinds of evidence around that. Um, and so, you know, having like white walls in a room where you'll come back to the same room every day and it's always the same white walls is the worst case scenario for learning. So like having a lecture every day in the same room that looks like the same room is the worst case scenario for your brain. It, it, it doesn't have anything to cling to to store the information. Um, the, the best example I can point to that we did at High Fidelity so far that's really awesome was we've got this Nefertari's tomb. I could show you a video online. We have this Nefertari's tomb experience where we uh, took a scan of Queen Nefertari's tomb. I, I'm saying that wrong. Nefertiti. Is it Nefertiti or Nefertari? There's two, there's two queens. I always forget. Um, and and we, we, we got this amazing scan of this tomb from Cairo, uh, and we, turned, we set it up in high fidelity, and then we hired Egyptologists who wanted to do it, you know, uh, postdocs, to actually do live tours of 10 to 15 people at a time through the tomb. And let me tell you that it's, I mean, it's what you'd imagine, right? It's in VR, you can walk around, you have the headset on. It's completely bonkers, right? I mean, you just flew to, I just sent you to Cairo, except it didn't cost $12,000 and however many tons of carbon. So, I mean, it's just, just incredibly uh, co cool. So, so I think the idea of like immersing yourself in a memorable environment that, that essentially gives you a memory cue that's distinctive and then doing something that's more similar to what we're doing right now, I bet you that that's what it looks like, or at least that's a viable starting point that's more leverage than this. Oh, just a couple of questions. One is, um, this world you're imagining, does it involve like children, young people, and old people, and have you designed around those things? And the second was, have you looked at or considered like brain interfaces? Yeah. So question number one, no, I don't think we're smart enough yet. That's a great question. Have we have we designed kind of for for different age ranges and their and their proclivities? Uh, I think that make, makes total sense. I just don't think. I don't think anybody's had enough time yet to really go after that. Of course, some of the early VR s systems like Rec Room and VR Chat, notably, uh, have a lot of kids in them. Um, we haven't really had that problem to a certain extent just because we haven't been successful enough yet. Um, um, but, and, and I do think it's important because I think kids are going to go to school in there. To the, to the uh, uh, wait a minute, what was the second question? How do you space that? Uh, brain computer. Oh, brain computer interface. Uh, See, my brain is failing. Yeah. Um, uh, I haven't seen anything that works, you know? Uh, brain-computer interfaces, I mean, my background's in physics, and 
you know, the skull is thick and the, the electricity through it, very minimal. So I think the problem with most of the BCI stuff is contact based, you know, contact electrodes. I haven't seen anything that was worth using unless you were dis disabled to the gentleman's question earlier, um, in which case it's, it's revolutionary. But well, that's going the other way. <laughs> and that's some crazy stuff, TM TMS. I don't want to run us out of time, but do you guys, I don't want to. Uh, we're good. We can, we can finish any time. Okay, I'm, I'm enjoying myself tremendously, but I want to. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. I'm, I'm glad. This is fun. Uh, yeah. Going back to some of your comments about fractals and this paragraph by uh, Dr. Loy, uh, I'm sure you've read Barnsley's book on uh, fractal image compression. Uh, Way back in the day, I, was, I, was, I worked with iterated systems when I was at Real Networks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I really identify with you, but uh, he said something in his book that was kind of disturbing, and that was that if we could in some way, and we can't, understand the fractal formula for how the universe assembles things, that we could see beyond what we can conventionally see now with the microscopes. And the example was take a parrot's eyeball is uh, take his fractal image compression algorithm, yeah. recreate the eyeball, now go one step beyond what could be collected using conventional photography. You're right. seeing things in the eyeball that would need an electron microscope or a quantum mechanical microscope. Yeah. My response to that is that, or my, my, my thing to think there is, I think that the storage architecture for objects in the virtual world will necessarily, in the long term, for that infinite level of detail point that I made, be some kind of a scale invariant, you know, sparse tree structure. So that would be my answer to that. I think what we're going to find is that the, uh, the data structure of the matrix, if you will, is some sort of a recursive hierarchy that has a great deal of, uh, that, that takes advantage of that for its compression. Um, so yeah, I, I think that I think if you think about like what is the nature of space in the metaverse, it is probably more through the hierarchical links, which is kind of a deep thing. I used to argue with my old CTO at Second Life about this. I was completely on the other side. I would say only it is humans that imagine hierarchy, which is which is also true. But I but I think the storage mechanism for sort of the metaverse uh, is likely to be some sort of a sparse recursive tree. Yeah. Yes. So I'm just thinking about like. So, um, in your opinion, um, and, and this is also like my my opinion um, at this point. It's like I think in terms of like having the lean spin and getting the mass adoption, this requires everyone to be uh, in on on the same road, I guess. So, what your uh, thought of like um, when is that going to happen? How is that going to happen? Like, yeah. Well, if there's equal opportunity for all in the software layer, so to speak, right? Then I think, as I was saying before, we're going to get we'll, we will get to the density of penetration that we had with smartphones. If we can make VR and AR as useful as a smartphone, which I think we can, and if we can do that, say in the next couple of years, then that means in the next ten years we're going to get to saturation. Now, the question, though, or if I may, the more nuanced question is the nature of the systems that are present in that software layer and whether they do harm or good. Generally speaking, communication technology has done well for us as a human species in terms of connecting us. But obviously, there are tremendous risks that we face right now with, I, I would just identify two risks that I'd say, you know, and then say, I could talk about these for days more from now. Risk number one is AI. Um, we've been talking about this. If we, if we use AI to serve us advertisements or to serve us video suggestions, uh, and this could get much worse in the virtual world, we are going to be uh, training these machines to tear us apart. We've seen a lot of good talk about this lately. Um, uh, you know, it's not just the fake news stuff, it's also just that if you, if you, if you, if you get AI, if you, if, you, if you tell AIs to exploit human weakness by advertising, they will, and we will fail for that. That's one thing. Um, and then the second thing is the, uh, and this is an even more damning problem, 
The second thing is the what we all have been calling, you know, what do we call it? Late stage capitalism has been the expression I've heard lately that's great. And the problem with that is, and this, this makes me think about crypto, if I can just be a bit philosophical here. Everybody with crypto is like, yeah, we got to make this free system where everybody starts over and it's, we've all got bitcoins instead of dollars. And I mean, it'll be in a level playing field. It won't though. Because the problem is that um, systems that have very low transaction frictions and, and can move very quickly concentrate wealth really quickly. And that's the big problem. I don't know how to solve that one. So I just, and I think about this stuff because I do view my work's goal as being to be of service. And I think that to be of good service, I don't yet know. When I started Second Life, I was much more starry-eyed. We were in a different time then, right? As a human culture, it was 2003. I was like, if I can just make this currency where everybody can pay everybody for anything, it'll all be good. And to a large extent, there is some truth in that, but once the rich get rich, they get richer and richer, and that happens exponentially fast. And that's what we got Amazon today, and we got, I mean, this is, it's crazy. So we have to somehow, I, I, I say this, I, I do, this is one where like I am most, do not yet have the answer. We have to do something that is both empowering, letting people go to school across the world, right? I mean, that by itself will be unbelievably empowering, and I would work single-mindedly single, single, single -mindedly just to enable that, right, with this, with this stuff. But once we've done that, we have to be mindful of the fact that as we've seen with uh, stars on social media and stuff, the more efficient the system is, the, the more efficiently the power law uh, moves all the money and success to a few. I don't know if you saw the recent article about, this is great when I love this being my age, uh, touring rock stars now uh, are the new 1%. Uh, touring rock musicians, touring, mu touring pop musicians the top like 10% or whatever now captures 65% of global revenue in entertainment. In 1980, that number was like 26%. So that's the problem. The, our more efficient mechanisms of communication are basically giving all the money to one person. There was a great economic theorist who said, uh, oh, Russell, Russell Nash, the beautiful mind guy. He said in the 1950s, the interesting thing about the American economy is that by now, one person doesn't just have all the money. <laughs> How horrible. And of course, the reason for that, I'm, I'm here, I'm just philosophizing, but I have had to do this because Second Life kind of is a world and a country. Um, the reason for that is disruption, which is fascinating. Technology is its own best and worst enemy, uh, or you know, best friend and worst enemy. Uh, it, the reason that one person doesn't have all the money is not uh, capitalism. Capitalism would give all the money to one person. It's just that we keep totally juggling the, reshuffling the balls, right? So Amazon.com took over from Walmart, who took over from Sears, who took over from whoever it was before that. So. Technology disruption. Now, maybe in VR, technology disruption like goes to some some ultraviolet catastrophe, right? Like maybe there's so much disruption in VR, latent in VR, that 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 we we we, we don't even have time to see the capitalism take take effect. But that's that sounds like totally wishful thinking to me. Yes. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on two particular applications of VR. Um, first is healthcare. Um, you didn't list it with those other uh, spaces you've called out, but I see a lot of new digital health startups. Um, and then the second is on the topic of like machine learning and, uh, and these algorithms making so many decisions in our lives these days. Um, I've read books that kind of celebrate VR as the way to take complex data like that and create a visualization that I can experience in VR and maybe with my natural capacities wrap my head around a little better yeah, than if it's just numbers in a spreadsheet. I would say, let me take the second one first. I always think that's a funny one. This is one of the places where I love to try to make my friends laugh about this. I don't think we understand data in 2D. So I, I think going to three is like, that's just punching us in the face, you know? I, I don't think we're smart enough to really look at data. But I, so I think the kind of minority report of like, I'm gonna take all the data and see the stock market upside down. I don't know. I, I personally, I know somebody's gonna get mad at me for this because there are, there are visualization exercises that I think are meaningful and interesting, but I would be the first to say, if you're working on that, be cautious about that, because that one feels like a good Hollywood story to me, but not, I'd never, I, I just can't think, uh, you t I cannot think of a single case where we visualized something in 3D and truly understood it. Um, but going back to healthcare, um, I think healthcare is a really great area, obviously. There's a lot of work going on, and partly because healthcare requires specialized techniques generally, both in hardware and software, it has been less a focus of my work than than you know what I mean than others, but but that's but 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 I think the work going on in healthcare is unbelievable. Uh, one thing I would say within the large space of healthcare, though, there's like care for the aging, 
which I think is an incredible opportunity for consumer VR. So I think like the idea of putting, putting headsets on people that are older or at home or are less mobile as a, as a powerful application, positive application for VR, totally. And that's one of the things I'd like to see like High Fidelity do a good job of. You know, like if you could, you know, if you could go on a trip or meet people or hang out in a square in London, you know, from 50 years ago, that would be absolutely awesome. And that we can do today with High Fidelity. So we're gonna probably run out of time, yeah. I think we'll end here. Thank you so much.